I first played TF2 around 10 years ago and it's one of my favourite games. I have an embarrassing amount of hours on it and an equally embarrassing YouTube channel yet somehow it was never interested by the lore. I decided recently to read all of it and for those who would want a recap of everything that's happened in the TF2 lore universe, or for those who've never got around to it like me, here is TF2's lore in 15 minutes. I'm going to try and contain every key part from the comic series, which covers the main story. However, there are also smaller nuggets of lore that I can cover, so if you enjoy this video and you want more, I can create more videos about those smaller things. It goes without saying, but condensing everything so much will leave out a lot of the charm and a lot of the small things that make the comics what they are. So if you are eager for more after watching this, I'd recommend you still read the comics too. Anyway, let's get into it. In 1850, two constantly squabbling sons, Redmond and Bluetark Man, convinced their father, Zephaniah, to buy most of the New Mexico desert and to move there. Upon Zephaniah's death, his munitions company Manco was left to Barnabas Hale and his gold to his maidservant Elizabeth, leaving his sons nothing but a useless land. They then decided to fight for it until the day they died. Both hired mercenaries to seize the lands from each other, the following conflict has been continuing for over 120 years. In 1890, Bluetark hired the engineer's grandfather to create a device to grant immortality to outlive Redmond and then win the land. The maidservant used the money from their father to secretly convince him to create the exact same machine for Redmond. The machine was powered by Australium, a precious substance that allowed Australians to outpace the world in technology. This allowed the war to continue even further. Team Fortress Classic looks like a completely different game, but it's part of the same history and was meant to be set in 1930, 40 years after the Immortality Machines were created. The present day, or the time you mostly play the game in, is 1972. The maidservant, now the administrator or the voiceover in game, we have captured the control point. seems to have the motive of keeping both sides fighting forever. She works for both sides with her assistant Miss Pauling, which both teams are unaware of. I'll get into why that is later. There's also a secret third brother that Zephaniah Man tried to smite at birth, but was taken away and raised by Eagle. He eventually ate the offspring of the Eagles and escaped to build his own empire, which is wild I know. He came back and he killed both brothers before sending his robot army to take over Manco, which is still being run by Saxton Hale, the grandson of Barnabas Hale, Zephaniah Man's friend from the beginning. In the next comic, it's revealed that the robot war, like most battles in this story, reached a stalemate. Grey Man concedes, offering a new proposition. He challenges Saxton Hale to a duel in hand-to-hand -hand combat, as Manco has a rule that if any other company CEO can beat Hale in hand-by-hand -hand combat, they take over the company. Quite a dauntless proposition, considering earlier in that comic, Hale destroyed a plane with his bare hands whilst fighting a yeti. The Grey had a trick, he promoted a little girl to the CEO position so that Hale would have to beat a child. He couldn't do it, and now a small girl is the CEO of Manco. Saxton Hale is forced to leave the country and he fires the mercenaries. They all flee to their respective countries and that's it. Until that is, Miss Pauling finds the soldier working as a tour guide for celebrity houses and tells him that she's trying to get the band back together. The pyro has become a millionaire CEO of Frontier Engineering, but still isn't happy. Soldier and Pauling get his attention by lighting a fire on an opposing skyscraper, reigniting Pyro's passion for igniting other things. Meanwhile, Grey Man and the little girl try to get their hands on Manco's Australian reserve, but it's all missing. The administrator had taken it. The Demo Man has been living back with his mother for a while and has become slobbish and unmotivated, swamped by his alcohol problem, but took no convincing to join the team again. Soldier and Demo then make their way out to Two Fort dressed as civilians, where Spy and Scout are about to be trialled and potentially hung for various crimes of vandalism and disrupting the town with all of the combat all these years. Scout jokes that his last lawyer was Soldier, who wasn't even a real soldier despite his name, which makes Soldier, who is disguised, so angry that he breaks the new attorney's neck before the hearing could even begin. Both Soldier and Demo are then added to the hanging and they're all on the stand, but Pauling busts in and quickly explains that the mayor can't legally hang anything or anyone or do very much at all, which saves the current four mercenaries from being hung. The town aren't confused by this at all and are considered idiots as the mercs fighting has caused lead to leak into the town's water supply, rotting the population and their respective brains. Heavy gets a note from a babushka he visits once a month in Siberia for supplies. It's from Miss Pauling saying to call urgently, but he just turns it down and walks away. The gang hunt down the old lady but she says the storms are too strong and the mountains are too treacherous to survive a journey to the heavy. One of Saxton Hale's old nemeses, Charles Darling, informs Saxton that the administrator and Miss Pauling had been manipulating red and blue by putting them against each other while stockpiling a gigantic Australian supply. The missing supply. He tells Saxton Hale that if he can get the Australian back and give it to him, he will get Manco back for him. 
soldier fights a bear naked and covered in honey. They find Heavy strolling along just before the bear's mother emerges, which they deal with swiftly. They let Heavy know that they're getting back together, but Heavy declines, as he needs to protect his family and that they should just leave in the morning. His sisters say that they can take care of themselves fine, and they've killed invaders in the past anyway. Heavy's back in the game, and taking his family over to America with him, promising they'll never have to eat bear meat again. Meanwhile, Grey hires the members of Team Fortress Classic to hunt down our mercenaries. They know where the mercs already are, but they need to wait until the mercs get in contact with the administrator, as Grey only wants the mercs to get to the administrator to get to the Australian. Is it a good time to mention that Gabe Newell's son is, is called Grey? I'm just saying, it's pretty weird. It sounds like a bit of a diss to his son. Does he want his son to be taken away by eagles? The boss in Half-Life 1 is also based off Grey, his son. <laughs> it seems so weird. It also turns out that the medic has been working for the TF2 Classic crew. He doesn't seem to care that they're against each other, saying, Hey, a chance to test my latest times against my Ali's experiments? No, that won't be a problem at all. To make matters worse, it doesn't seem like Sniper is very happy that they're tracking him down. Demo and Pauling find Sniper's house abandoned, but while searching, Demo gets sedated by him. Sniper explains that his parents recently died and that they weren't even his real ones, and so he threatens Miss Pauling to tell him who his real ones are, as she's the only one who knows anything about him. She tells him that they were actually on the way to meet his parents already, and all three leave and continue the mission. Whilst looking for Australium in the mine, Saxon Hale bumps into the scout and Heavy. He asks them if the administrator sent them, and they say yes, even though it was Miss Pauling. They realise they're both just looking for the people that took the Australium, so decide to team up. At this point, we finally get to see the administrator alone. Well, not quite alone. She's got an engineer to keep her alive with an Australium device that's attached to her arm. She says that she doesn't need to be kept alive forever. No one does, just long enough to settle an old debt. Sniper, Pauling, and Soldier travel to a sunken city in New Zealand, where Sniper's real parents, as well as the last store of Australium, supposedly reside. They're welcomed by Sniper's father, he was the one who suggested that New Zealand should be hidden in the sea for safety. He also proposed to the elders of New Zealand that they should be in an even safer place, space. He was shunned by the idea and built a rocket for himself, but baby Sniper crawled into the one-seated craft while his parents were arguing and took off into the sky. And back down again, landing in his Australian foster parents' garden, so he's basically like backwards Superman or something. Sniper's father then confessed to wasting all of the remaining Australium on prototype rockets as Pauling and Sniper's mum get wine drunk. Too much so as when everyone's distracted, Sniper's mum slips off and flies into space in the last prototype rocket coated in Australium, the one thing that the administrator sent them to get. To make things worse, Sniper's dad ran off in a submarine, leaving the mercenaries to drown. Oh, and at that second, the TF Classic crew just whipped up. And to make things even worse, they just shot Sniper, and he's dead, the first mercenary to die. The TF Classic crew and the medic took what was left of the Australian and returned it to give to Grey as well as interrogate our mercenary. The head of the TF Classic crew discovered that Grey will be at least 150 by the time he takes over the world, and realises how powerful the Australian really is and what Grey is using it for. He threatens Grey for some for himself and his crew, but Grey declines so they bring him down to the torture room where Soldier and his girlfriend are, who I know I haven't really mentioned but until this point in the story is basically just comic relief really. Oh and she's Heavy's sister, <laughs> Soldier you dog. The TF Classic guy rips off Grey's Australian backpack which is keeping him alive so he falls to the floor writhing in pain. Soldier's girlfriend, Xana, spots glass from the fool, uses it to escape by literally cutting her arm off, and gasses the torture from inside her suit with gas probably kickstarting that whole weird link between TF2 and the strain's fascination with inflation. Grey tries to convince them both to take him to Miss Pauling, who knows where the administrator is, who knows where the Australian is, while practically still dying on the floor. Meanwhile, Heavy and Scout roll up just in time to stop Spy and Miss Pauling ingesting cyanide to avoid torture and free them as well as the other mercs. Heavy says that there are too many robots to escape, but if he sacrifices himself, there'll be a big enough distraction for Miss Pauling and the rest to get out and find the administrator. Another guard rolls up and takes Miss Pauling hostage. Xana punches Pauling in the face, hitting the guard behind him, knocking him out to be strangled by Spy's feet. Uh, then Pauling is dead, but only for like one second. I didn't even take it in to be honest, Soldier just revives her by literally poking her and then her heart starts again. Lovely. Grey begs Pauling for help, despite getting Sniper killed and almost torturing them and hunting them down. He explains that the administrator is way smarter than him, but also way angrier, and that what she's planning is probably way worse than what he was, and that either way they should stop her. The last of the Manco brothers then passes away, while Miss Pauling rants about how she knows what the administrator is capable of, which allows Spy to kind of get an inkling pretty quickly of what she was lying about, i.e. getting red and blue to fight against one another forever. The medic announces that he'll be able to revive Sniper in 6 hours. Were any of you surprised though really? They couldn't just kill one of the 9 mercenaries. 
and we've seen Medic revive people in MVM before. Though he does say it will be very hard. Not impossible, just very hard. Oh, but there you go, it's, it's done in the next panel, hooray! Except not quite hooray, Ah, oh. Sniper is super mad at the Medic because, well, Medic was with the people that killed him. The head of TF Classic enters, quaking at the fact that Sniper is alive again, and kills Archimedes with his rage. Honestly, tragic. Take Sniper again, I really don't care, I just don't want Archimedes to be dead. Hey, thank god, Medic saves him. Does anyone actually die in this comic? Anyway, the TF Classic captain gets a call that the Mercs have killed some of his own men and prepares to fight. Medic is still on this guy's side and says that he'll be right behind him, but the captain says that he needs an actual soldier, not a nurse, and if he wants Medic to be useful, he should just find Sniper and kill him again. Meanwhile, the others are trying to escape fighting blood-sucking robots that the Classic crew had released from Grey's munitions, originally used for sucking Australian from blood. Luckily, they are dealt with due to Demoman's extremely high blood alcohol levels, and without Grey to control the robot army, Scout and Heavy were able to escape their deadly diversion and reconnect with the mercs. Scout hugs Miss Pauling a bit too tightly, and Heavy finds out about the affair between his sister and Soldier. During this family reunion, the TF Classic team were able to get Grey's robots back up and running. Luckily, Hale and Mags were just behind the Heavy and Scout in a plane and managed to drop themselves along with supplies. Sasha, I have missed your bus. Spy and Sniper try to distract the TF Classic Sniper, but Spy ends up being shot. Sniper barely escapes, but then manages to sneak back round outside the window and kill the TFC Sniper. Naked, honey-covered soldier and Xana, as well as clothed Pyro, Scout, Miss Pauling, Hale, and Mags deal with the robots. Spy and Sniper come across Scout who's wounded. He managed to fend off a huge amount of robots, but now he's starting to see a bright light. And Tom Jones. To which he shows him his Tom Jones tattoo. Tom Jones tells the Scout that years ago he slept with his mother when he was young and ran away in fear afterwards. He says that the Scout, Jeremy, named after German 985, is stronger than he'd ever know and that he's proud of him. Proud of his son. Freaking awesome! Scout dies. Boom! Now he's in heaven. Scout explains that no one on earth appreciated his gargantuan muscles. This made God livid. I am fucking raging! And threatened to plague the world. Scout convinced him not to do it, and God said that he'd give everyone one last chance to appreciate Scout's massive muscles if he sent Scout back down one last time. Miss Pauling calls the administrator, but the engineer picks up. He explains that they need the Australian extremely soon. Pauling tells him that it's all gone, but NG can't even pass the information onto the administrator because she's dead in her chair. The TF Classic level 100 mob boss finds Medic and says that he wants the Medic to attach the Australian pack onto his back so that he can live for eternity. But Medic slashes him in the face with an Ubersaw before giving him a cesarean section through the stomach. He falls to the floor, but then slowly rips out the blade, confidently walks towards his former employee, leaps onto him and pins him down. He says he has no need for the medic anymore because he knows where the administrator is and she can attach the Australian to him. This monologue was a bit on the slow side as Heavy had time to rev up Sasha right behind him. The temptation of an anime death also got the better of Heavy though, giving the TF Classic boss the time to get out a pistol and shoot medic. The TF Classic boss tries to tempt Heavy with immortality but Heavy declines the offer, drilling his cranium into the bosses and body slamming him onto his knee. Before he can die though, he attaches the Australian device and begins to go Super Saiyan. He turns the fight around and starts to beat Heavy. Medic's body is alongside the brawl, but Medic's soul is elsewhere. He confers with Satan about his deal with the devil. The devil owns Medic's soul, and since they have a majority of the soul, can send him to hell. However, Medic has implanted eight other hearts into himself, so the devil now technically only owns one ninth of Medic's soul, so legally he can't do anything. Satan is not impressed that a being has been taken from his grasp. Medic extends an offer to return to Earth for another 50 years, and if he is allowed to do so, he would accept most of the deals of the devil that Satan gives him, for the remaining 8 other souls. For example, Medic says that if Satan allows him to borrow his ballpoint pen, that'll count as a deal with the devil and he'll have one more of Medic's souls. He then uses that ballpoint pen as a detonator to induce labour pains into a baboon uterus that Medic had put into each of the TF Classic mercenaries earlier on, when they were on the same team. These baboon fetuses are usually 30 pounds at birth, not including the fertility hormones. Turns out this wasn't true at all, and it was just a distraction for Heavy to come and rip out the Australian machine, though Medic had in fact planted all the members of the TF Classic team with a baboon uteri, and did have a similar detonator, however the pen he was holding was of course just the fake from the devil. Uh, this, this, is getting, this is getting way too surreal, but, but basically the TF Co boss falls to the ground and passes away.
A lot of dying and not dying in the story though, right? So who knows really? The Mercs have victory over the evil for now though. They have no Australian, but at least they're safe. And Medic has a new baby baboon buddy too. The administrator's Australian ticks on. The engineer says she's been dead for four hours. They're having to ration the Australian to keep her alive. And there's only one more stick of Australian left in the entire world, apart from Stiper's mum's rocket ship floating around somewhere in the solar system. The engineer suspects that the administrator has around five months left of life with the remaining Australian. She says she still craves it as much as she did when she was a little girl, and she's been keeping this going too long. She uses all of the remaining Australian at once, which lowers her life expectancy down to one hour. She's young again. And she suspects she has enough time to conclude this once and for all. And that's it. That was the last comic to be released, probably ever. You are now up to date with the lore, and probably just as annoyed as everyone else that this may never ever be concluded. Issue 7 has not been in the works for years. Jay Pinkerton, the co-writer, says, I'm still contracting, so hopefully issue number 7 comes out, but if not, I'll happily get around the campfire to tell you all the plot. So at least if there's not an official release, we still might be able to find out what happened. I hope you enjoyed that. I was never too interested in lore, but I just kind of found the game fun, but I found this video really fun to do too, and I'm happy to do more TF2 lore videos in the future if you enjoyed this one. So just let me know in the comments, like and subscribe, thanks for watching, and I'll see you later.